Hey there. Tired Sis Admin, interesting name. Alright, well, there's the pipe. The lighting's gonna not be great for you. There's the pipe anyway. <coughs> First thing I'm gonna do is gonna bend the stem and I will then get to staining. Right, where's my thick glove? Stem gets really hot, so I always wear two layers, and the top one is a very thick leather covered builder's construction kind of glove that allows me to shape it exactly how I want. This is a, an acrylic Cumberland stem with a German silver band. Evening, Robin. Evening, Jack.
Bye, Jimmy. There we have, that's the shape, done. Sanding is done, stem is done. So now we're gonna stain. Well, we shall see. Well, either way, it won't be a shop pipe. It might just be a personal pipe. You know, I quite agree with you. It's too nice to have lying around in the in the workshop. But well, if I don't sell it, I'll just it'll be in my rotation. That's all. Yeah, that this uh, has got some nice grain for sure. This is uh, Feebing's leather dye, it's called. 
and just keep putting on the layers until it gets almost black. And then I let it dry, let it soak in, and then take it, most of it off and just leave <clears throat> the grain. Some people leave them overnight. I just, I don't leave them that long at all. Most of mine I can leave them for an hour or so, but I'm looking. I'm definitely, I definitely buy pipes. I'm just more selective. I've got a pipe on the way currently from uh, Northern Briars, and I've got two pipes on the way from um, from other artisan pipe makers. One from America, and I've got one from Germany. Just because I make pipes, I'm still a pipe collector, and um, I still enjoy. Especially the older collectors, they tended to, if, for instance, if they were into Dunhill pipes, they would just build and build and build their collection of Dunhills, get every shape. That would be their aim, you know, get every shape of pipe that they can in the Dunhill range, whether it's Sheraton. Um, you know, there's a lot of people into Sheraton or Barlings, pre-transition pre, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And it's their aim to get as many pieces as they can of that make. I'm different. I've got this thing where, although I still don't call myself a collector per se, I do have this thing that I'd like to have at least one pipe from some of the carvers out there that I like and I admire. So I can just have, number one, I want to be able to give them the business. And, um, and as I say, I've still got it in my heart. It's not just about smoking the pipes. If it was just about smoking, then obviously I'd be happy with my own. I am happy with my own, but I still like the idea of having some uh, other pipes besides for my own. If that makes sense. I have seen couch pipes. I'm pretty sure that I follow him on Instagram. So you can see it's almost black now. By putting the flame on it, it helps to sort of burnish the stain into the, it opens the, the pores of the wood and it helps the stain to get uh, absorbed. It dries the layer so you can get the next layer on. And I usually end up doing at least half a dozen layers before I'm ready to let it sit. Yeah, I mean, the ring was a byproduct of, of the way I carved this pipe, the way I turned the pipe on the lathe. It wasn't my original intention. My original intention was to have, you know, a couple of standard rings like you have on a Rhodesian. Uh, but with the way this laid out and the way things worked out, it just ended up being like this. And um, I think it's putting a really nice emphasis on it. And hopefully the grain will pop through on the top side. I'm really hoping that it does. Right, I think we'll go one more layer, and then that's this phase done with. And then we'll put
pop back a bit later to finish it off. Well, the next video will actually be a recorded video, not live. It'll just be me showing the finished product. There's no point going live again just for the buffing. Okay, so there's the stained pipe. And we let this dry for a bit and we will come back a bit later on. So we can just have a chat. I'm gonna light my cigar. And if you like, we can just sit and have a chat. You can ask me anything you'd like to know. Hey, Ken. favorite pipe makers? That's a very good question. Most of them I haven't been able to buy a pipe from so far. Um, a pipe maker that I would love to buy from but I can't because he doesn't do 9 mil pipes. And that is uh, Bob Keys, Do Dr. Bob, uh, Dr. Bob Pipes out in... Um, somewhere in America, maybe Canada, I forget. And in particular, he does a beautiful hawkbill pipe. But what looks so amazing with his pipes is his rustication. His rustication is his trademark. I mean, he does smooth pipes as well, but he's got this phenomenal finish on the rustication. Interesting thing about this cigar, it's uh, specially selected, is I actually started it yesterday, left it overnight here in the garage. It actually tastes better today. It tastes very good anyway. Well, it's now quarter past 11, Jimmy, and we started um, started probably around five, five o'clock. So uh, we're going on for about seven hours, almost. It gives you an idea, you know, when people balk at the prices with some carver's charge. Okay, granted, I'm early on in my career, but £150 for a pipe or £200 for a pipe is really, really not a lot of money considering the work that's gone into it. If you think of it in terms of time, so even uh, £200, that's uh, that's about 20 pounds an hour for a craftsman. It's not a lot of money. Put it this way, if I was doing photography, which is my normal day job, um, I would earn three times that per hour. Um, I charge roughly £100 an hour for my photography. It doesn't quite work out like that. It's actually a lot less because you're doing processing work afterwards. But um, Still, that's the one good thing about pipe making is that when you're done, you're done. When your pipe's finished, you sell it, you're done. Um, so, favourite pipe makers, Mike. So, as I was saying, uh, Bob Keys, 
Although I've never actually held one of his pipes, I just like the way they look. They look phenomenal. Another American pipe maker, Steve Morissette. I would really love to own one of his pipes. I have been in touch with him, and he does do 9mm, so one day. But um, his pricing is actually already up there. You know, you're talking about four, five hundred dollars. So it's a bit more than I would usually spend. The two pipes that I have on, on the go, um, you're looking at around the 200, 250 dollar mark. And that's about for a, for an artisan pipe for me in my personal financial situation is about right. It's it's more than I've usually spent, but because they're artisan pipes and being made for me, I'm happy to pay that. Um, and I've got, obviously, uh, my Ian Walker pipe, which I should be getting any day now, number two in the current set that I'm making. This is the second seven-day set. Um, the first seven-day set, which I had made by him, was a smooth set before I went over to 9 mil pipes. So besides for one of them, they're all sold now. So one of them I was able to convert to 9 mil. So now I'm building that, um, if, you know, if you've seen that Lovat that I've got from him, that tan rusticated one. So um, I may well build a seven day set of that style. The second pipe that's coming is built in the same style, just a different shape, same silver band, same tan rustication, same uh, Cumberland stem. Sticker shock, I like that, Jimmy. I've not heard that saying before. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember once I was quite naive, um, well before I started. We're talking about probably three, four years ago. I had ordered a pipe from Paul Menard. Paul Menard. Paul's pipes. And I asked him to make me an extra stem. After I'd already had the pipe. I asked, it was like a church warden pipe. I asked him to make me a short stubby stem, which would make it into a stubby pipe. And he did it, and he did a perfectly nice stem. But he charged me at the time, I think it was about $80 for the stem, which was a third of the price of the uh, of more, I think, actually. Probably, uh, yeah, maybe about a third of the price of the pipe that I'd paid for the original pipe. And I really balked at that. And um, I think I upset him because, you know, he said the amount of time that goes into making a stem from scratch that's what it is, you know, and, um, and you know, I appreciate that now more than I did then. I have made mortar pipes. Um, I've made a few. I've probably made half a dozen, all told. Maybe four or five, maybe, something like that. And I spoke about it, actually, in a video I recorded this morning. I actually recorded a drive video sort of charting my journey into pipe making and some of the pitfalls that I've had. And one of them was... It basically wasn't so much about me. It was about talking and commenting on Jason Mouton's interview with Cane Rod Piper and um, just sort of how some of that affects me and how I, my experience has been so far. And one of the things was about um, mortar. So I'd made a pipe, um, actually turned out to be a really nice apple out of mortar. And um, uh, the customer basically contacted me after about a week or two and said that it's literally a whole chunk of it had just disintegrated inside the bowl, disappeared. Um, and that's the thing with mortar, you can get... This is mortar, really nice piece actually. It's quite a big piece. This one is less than half the size, but it almost weighs as much as this piece. You get some pieces which are absolutely featherweight, nothing to them. 
and you can get a sandwich are much denser and weigh a lot more. So I had to make the guy a new pipe, which I did. And um, I also, I had no use for his pipe really. So I fixed his pipe, put a new uh, inside layer into the pipe, uh, um, sort of a bowl protection, and sent them both to him. And hopefully he was happy and I hope he's managed to smoke the other one. Jason Mouton, so basically, he was saying that he wouldn't make any uh, briar bowls out of mortar anymore. In other words, a briar pipe, uh, a mortar pipe, which was completely mortar. What he has done recently is a calabash, where the, the the frame of the pipe, if you like, is made out of mortar, but he has a bowl insert, which I think is made of briar. And that's a really nice way to go, because your mortar is not going to get disintegrated. It's not touched at all uh, by the heat. Yeah, Ken, that makes absolute sense. A lot of sense is, is to put a, a very thick coating on it. And that's what I did with the pipe that I repaired. And I also on the new pipe to prevent it happening again, I put a decent coating on there as well. In terms of cigars, my go-to cigar is the H. Hartman Connoisseur number one. But I do like the uh, specially selected. Um, I do... Tend to enjoy a lot of the regional editions of Cuban cigars. I do have, I do usually buy them up each year. So I do have a few boxes of regionals as well. And they tend to have a little bit extra spice, a little bit extra sort of sweet sharpness to them, which I enjoy. And uh, they tend to also sometimes mature a bit quicker than the regular lines. I don't know if that's just my imagination or if that's the reality. Drying up nicely. See, it looks pretty much almost black. And really, the color is like a medium brown. But it's got layer after layer after layer, so it becomes opaque. So that soaks into the softer grain and not into the hard grain. So when you take it back, um, when you, you remove uh, the layers of stain, what you're left with is just the stain, which is absorbed into the softer grain. And that's the lines that you see afterwards as a grain on a pipe. That should be true, Jimmy. I think mortar generally is more brittle. Um, it's, it's drier and more brittle. And uh, it can char up and become like uh, charcoal almost. Uh, easier than briar. I mean, briar is, is really a special, it's really got a special possession. The person that discovered it, why and how, I've got no idea. But um, the story goes that in France, actually, it was discovered. Even though it was championed in the UK, in England before any other country, but it was discovered. Um, I believe the story goes that it was discovered in France. Where um, a guy who generally smoked clays or meerschaum pipes, his meerschaum pipe smashed and he was left st stuck without a pipe. And his shoemaker or cobbler um, basically had some wood. And he said, um, he obviously had a bit of this briar wood and he said, why don't you let me try? And I think because briar used to be used for carvings and things like that. And he said, let me make you a pipe. And he made him the pipe and basically he liked it so much he ordered more and it went from there. That's the story, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Monte Fortuna. Um, I, I buy mine from I Havana. Peterson Grand Reserve, no, I haven't tried that. Um, I hardly smoke non-Cuban cigars these days. Occasionally I'll smoke an Oliva Serie V um, Milano. I have a couple of those left still. Occasionally I'll smoke uh, an Undercrown, um, and that's really about it. I do have a Tapador, sort of with about maybe 20 or 30 non-Cubans. Um, also, another really, really good 
very good quality non-Cuban cigar is the Davidoff Late Hour. Um, I generally don't like Davidoff cigars, um, but the Late Hour is really a very, very good smoke. Very, very close to Cuban tip, uh, taste. Mm. That's what Jason called it in his interview. He called it magic, which it, it really is. I mean, the, in terms of pipe smoking, it is magic. Yeah, semi-petrified oak, that's a very good way of describing that it will burn like oak and basically it will char. Um, that's a good way of describing it because that is the, real the reality. Hi Boris, how are you doing? I got a new uh, delivery of Bryron today. Some nice blocks in there. And I should be getting another box tomorrow with a few more uh, blocks of Briar. I was starting to get a bit low, so at least I'll be a little bit more stocked up. The problem is, I mean, I really, I'd like to have, you know, a couple of hundred blocks in stock at any time, but it's just so expensive. The blocks that I get, you know, you're talking about 20, could be 20 or 30 dollars a block sometimes 100 dollars gets you three four blocks five blocks if you're lucky it's just so expensive um, and i haven't got a thousand dollars to go out and spend and get a couple of hundred blocks you know but i try to just every so often order another half a dozen another 10 that kind of thing i'm trying to build it up but um i seem to be making them as fast as i get them Yeah, Ken, absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. It's obviously very dependent on, on how you break the pipe in. Because like a lot of woods, um, in fact, wood can be a very fire-resistant material. Um, if a wood is charred all the way, all the way around, um, it is much more resistant to burning. Um, if it's a flame and uh, it just sort of burns in a very, very high heat, then obviously it's going to get burnt all the way through. But if you char a piece of wood all the way around on all sides and then put the fire out and it's it's um i don't know if it's impossible but it might be almost impossible to relight it because you can't you can't burn char you can't burn coal as such you can't set it alight you can heat it up but not necessarily and that's basically what happens with um when you when you break your pipe in um that first bowl that's why some people say that you must fill it to the top of the bowl and burn it all the way down to the hill so that you get an even char all the way down, an even lay layer of carbon. So that way when you smoke it in future, you're not uh, burning through to the wood. Well, briar, Mike, has been becoming scarce for a long time, certainly in the quality that they, it used to be available. And only the, the guys who are prepared to pay 80 or $100 for a block are getting the very best. So you're talking about people like Nana Everson um, and um, Tom Eltang, these kind of people. They're paying $80-ish, $80 uh, you know, for a block, maybe more. They get the, the really the very best grain. Um, but um, I, I'm not in that. Uh, even if I would get one of those and I would have a pipe which looked absolutely stunning with a perfect straight grain, I just couldn't charge enough. I'm not yet, uh, I haven't got enough of a, uh, a standing in, in the pipe business to be able to command much higher prices.
Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, they do look pretty good. I still have to perfect it, but um, it certainly looks a lot better um, within that lighting tent, those pictures. Um, the website is actually nearly ready to go, which I'm quite excited about. Um, I just need to take pictures of the pipes. Mm, absolutely can. They're expensive. You know, if somebody spends $80 on a block, you can't very well charge $150 for it. You know, he's got to be charging around $800 to $1,000 for a, a block that like that. If he's paying $80 to $100 and then putting his time and expertise in, into it, you know, I think it's perfectly understandable that such a person would be paying that, uh, charging that kind of money. I mean, Jeff Grasick, um, who's now seen as one of the best American carvers in the world, um, I think his pipes come in anywhere between 400 and a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars depending on the pipe you know you can't expect a guy who's at the top of his game to to be to be charging two hundred dollars it's just not possible i don't know mike i don't think so it's not that scarce you know um there is a, a popular held belief that companies like for instance savinelli um that they have at any one time around a million blocks in stock so as they deplete it, they re replenish. So they always make sure they've got around a million blocks in stock. So it can't be scarce if they're able to retain that amount of briar. And uh, people like, um, uh, say, uh, Castello, for instance, they must have, I would say, you know, five to 10,000 blocks in stock at any time. They have to, because if it ever goes scarce, they have to be able to continue um, and not worry about where they're going to get the next block from. I mean, you can get cheaper, Briar. When I first started, and whenever people ask me uh, where to get Briar from, this is where I point them to. Um, I got my first Briar from Alexander Briars in Greece. Um, they're, they're a, you know, the, the shipping is not the fastest in the world. And the communication is not awesome, but you get what you pay for. But you can get blocks for five, six dollars, you know, and you can certainly get blocks for ten dollars. Um, they won't be the best briar in the world, but if you're starting out, they're fantastic for learning shaping. And that's what I did. And, and I would say the first maybe 30 or 40 pipes probably came from Alexander Briars. Some of them had some fantastic grain, um, but it was the best way to start because I didn't want to spend a fortune on briar mess up a couple of blocks here and there and, and that's wasted hi paul um i don't know if they're if they're replenishing um i don't know if they're um if they're replanting um it's possible that they're not i honestly don't know that um, because generally the best briar lives in in the harder to to harvest places it tends to be in the rocky cliff sides um, and, uh, and and the more sort of harsh the weather conditions, the more the burl seems to be better for making pipes. Um, so if they are replanting them, they're probably planting them more inland. So perhaps not giving the same quality of briar. Hi, Daniel. This is where today's pipe is up to. It's a full bent pipe. My first. And there's the stem for it, which is a Cumberland, with a silver band. And hopefully it will look awesome when it's finished. Um, so, Ken, in terms of the cigars, uh, as I say, my, my go-to would be um, Connoisseur, H, H. Upman Connoisseur number one, um, and most of the H. Upman line. I'm not a big fan of the 46s, the Mag 46s, Magnum 46, the Magnum 50s I like. haven't had one of those in ages. Um, I still have 
the big 56 ring gauge, the Magnum 56 from 2015. I've got one left of those. Something along those lines, Ken. They, they certainly live in harsh conditions with uh, very gritty, stony kind of regions um, and hard to get for the people who harvest it, who harvest the, 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 the burls. Yeah, 50 ring gauges is mine too. 48, 50, 52. Um, anything less than that, um, it's okay, but um, it's just not my sweet spot. And 56, 54 is a little bit much. Um, uh, the Undercrown Robustos are 54. But like everything in America, they're bigger. <laughs> so the Robusto here, traditional Robusto, is 49, 50 ring gauge. In America, it's 52, 54. Um, a connoisseur number two, yes, they, ha they do have. They have at the moment connoisseur A, and recently they brought out connoisseur B, uh, a couple of years back. But um, those ones are more expensive, they're bigger. Um, and as I say, for me, the connoisseur number one is, I think it's a 47 ring gauge, actually, the connoisseur number one. And for me, that's just spot on, absolutely perfect size for me. I don't usually have hours and hours to smoke a cigar. Um, so, I mean, even the H. Upman Half Corona, which is a, a 44 ring gauge, I think it is. I think it's three and a half inches by 44 ring gauge. Actually, what I would like to try is the Partisix, Part, Partigas, I think it's an E6 it's called, which is a very short uh, three and a half inch, I think, as well, at a 50 ring gauge. I don't think I've tried those. I'd like to try those. The E5 is actually a very nice cigar. The E5 is, I think, a 52 or a 54 ring gauge by, I think, six inches or thereabouts. And that's actually a, it's a good tasting cigar. But also it needs age. Like most Cuban cigars, it, it does need some age. Otherwise, Partagas, the D4 is nice. Um, but it's not something that I sort of rush out to get. I'll smoke it and enjoy it for sure. I have bought them in the past. Um, I haven't smoked a lot of Monte Cristos. I used to be completely... That used to be my go-to. Yeah, I agree, Ken. Um, I go for the shorties myself now more as well. So when I buy regional editions, I go for the short ones. Three and a half, four inches, four and a bit. Perfect size for me. The four inch line is, is just right. Four by fifties for me is perfect. Uh, what was I saying? What did I just start talking? I started making a point about something. It's completely gone out of my mind. The D6, yes, Jack, sorry. The D6, not the E6. Anyway, I don't remember what I'd started saying. Um, but the H. Upman Half Corona, three and a half inch by 44 ring gauge. The 44 is less than I would usually go for, but it's wide enough to feel okay. The 42, the Corona size, um, the Half Coronas, uh, not really for me. I'll smoke them, but they're not really my size. 44 ring gauge is, is pretty good. Uh, oh yeah, I was talking about Monte Cristos. So I used to, my go-to cigar, uh, used to be the Monte Cristo Petit... Uh, the small uh, torpedo. Petit number two, it was called. The petit number two used to be my go-to uh, a couple of years back. I smoked an awful lot of those. Um, and they were great because the number two itself is a really nice cigar, which is a, a 50 ring gauge by about six and a half inches. So that's a normal, um, that's a normal torpedo. That's a normal Pyramides size. So you've got that in the, You've got the Partigas uh, P2, you've got the H. Upman number two, you've got the uh, Cohiba Pyramides, you've got the um, you've got the Diplomaticos number two. Um, so there's about five or six of these torpedo uh, the Pyramides um, size uh, Vitola. Um, and I really liked the Monte Cristo more than any of them. 
And when um, I discovered the, the Monte Cristo number two, the Petit number two, for me, that was such a great sweet spot because it, it wasn't, I didn't have to smoke it for two hours. I could smoke it for an hour, an hour and a quarter. Um, and the thing about that one is usually in the full length cigar, you'd have obviously the three stages of the cigar. Um, and I found that in the Petit number two, you kind of went straight into stage two almost. You had a little bit of that stage one, but it was much shorter and you went straight into stage two and you really got the flavor pretty, you know, pretty much straight away. Um, and if you got some of those with decent age on them, phenomenal. They are a little bit stronger than the others. Um, another cigar which I never used to like, which I do like now, is the Romeo e Giulietta. Um, when I first started smoking cigars, I tried them and I found them to be very, very bland. Um, and obviously at that stage, I didn't know much about aging and that kind of thing. Um... But, um, you know, a couple of years back, I discovered the, um, the, the Romeo y Julieta Wide Churchill. And I was very lucky to get some, a very good year. And they had a really nice, ready brown kind of wrapper. And they were so sweet and flavorful. Um, had a, a few boxes of those, you know, the 10 number boxes, not the 25s. Um, and I really enjoyed those. I've got a box upstairs now, a 10 box, but it's not ready. It's it's really fresh. I think it's from 2019. I don't think I've even had one. Um, it's just not worth it. It's a waste to smoke them now. But I really enjoyed those. The White Churchills are actually a really good cigar when they've got the right amount of age on them. Have I seen Peterson Summertime Blend 2020? No. Nope. Um, I haven't seen it as yet. Um, I don't. I don't tend to like those aromatics, um, the Peterson ones, because to me they're very, very American style, and they're a bit too artificial tasting to my palate. But I haven't tried one for a long time, so maybe now they're better. I don't know. Twenty nineteen, they, they they had a, a sort of a more English style, uh, not Latakia, but English style, a more natural style tobacco. I tried that as well. I wasn't a big fan, to be honest. Um, I haven't finished yet, George. I haven't finished yet. Um, okay, so M Cigar 77. I'll show you where we're up to on the pipe. So I've done the, the stem bending. Put a, a band on it as well. And it's got its um, staining on it. It's uh, quite a big cigar, quite a big pipe this. But because it's bent, it, uh, it'll be easy to smoke. Some nice shaping there. Really good shaping around the shank. And I really like this junction here. Worked out well. And this, especially this bit over here, which I spent... This junction here, I probably spent an hour and a half um, doing that. Um, I only just finished putting the stain on about uh, maybe 20 minutes ago, something like that. I'm not going to leave it on for too long. Um, the, the process that I use for doing the final um, sort of uh, stage, um, I don't need it to. Some people like to leave it overnight and that kind of thing. I don't need to do that. So uh, we'll carry on chatting as long as you guys want to chat. And then when we're finished, I'll, I'll do the final stage. I really could do with another coffee. I'm at the end of this one. Mm -hmm. I did use the lighter, yeah, to burn it off. It's not so much burning the alcohol. It, the idea of, of, the, of the flame is that... Um, Hi, James. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having you guys along. Uh, you, I, I'm a bit hesitant sometimes. I used to do the lives sort of more often making a pipe, but I do find that I get distracted, not so much because I'm intimidated by it or the pressure of it. I'm just, well, I suppose there is a pressure, not, not a pressure which because I'm intimidated, but a pressure that I've got people watching and, and if I take too much time, I'm boring you. And that, that kind of, I feel that pressure that I, should, I need to keep you guys sort of engaged. Um, and that sometimes you know, can be distracting. Um, so that's why when I first started part one of this um, live sessions, 
I wrote in the, in the description there that I probably won't be uh, chatting very much because I just wanted to focus on what I was doing. Um, but um, I think it's really nice. I've had so many people email me about that, you know, they're starting off and they want to know about how to get into it. Um, and I just think it's nice to be able to share these, you know, the process and people can, I'm not saying I'm any expert or anything like that, but this is where I'm at and this is how I do it. And if it's helpful, then why not? So, Paul, how's it like to be a moderator? I see you moderating on, uh, um, I think, on, on Cane Rods and on Chads, maybe, on their lives. That's very kind of you to see. Tired. Thank you. Me and the family... Um, yeah, doing well, thank God. Yeah, hi Tony, <laughs> we're still at it. I'm just waiting for the stain to absorb enough for me to be able to do the next stage. So it's pretty much dry. I'm just going to let it as long as I can to uh, absorb. What I've done is I've also just stained a few of the highlights of the plateau. I've not done that before. I'm going to see how that comes out when I, when I uh, buff it. See if that uh, gives it a little bit extra. Thankfully, I um, haven't really needed it, Paul. Um, we did have a couple of sessions going back maybe six months or so. And a few of us, um, it was actually, uh, Match has had the same problem. I had that problem. Uh, Mike Briar Blues had that problem, but it was only for a short while um, that we were having uh, trolls, um, you know, being obscene and that kind of thing. Um, but they, we just ignored them or blocked them, and they've thankfully not returned. The idea of this is, is it's all one stain. Um, I might do what I usually often do is a bit of fading and that kind of thing um, to highlight certain areas. But what I'm really hoping is that I'm hoping that this ledge here, because this has got a lot of straight grain going up the side of the bowl, so it, that should terminate as bird's eye over here. It won't over here because it's slanting. So what you'll get is like a flame effect. So that should look nice as well. Um, but hopefully I'll get the bird's eye here and I'll get the bird's eye here. So the bird's eye basically is the end, both ends of the strands of the straight grain. You get the bird's eye. So I'm really hoping that I'll get really nice bird's eye along here. Um, and then you'll see the straight grain continuing up that part over there. So bird's eye on the bottom section of the, of the ring and straight grain hopefully up there and then going into like a flame over here. Um, and the straight grain it will be actually going straight. Usually on a, on a horizontal st uh, shank, you'll have the straight grain going up the sides, but because this is almost a fully straight shank, what you'll get is these straight grains will be going up the length of the shank, which should be quite interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, I tried to, to try and get something interesting going here with the bottom, and it's, what it's ended up in is a little... I wanted to see some of that bird's eye, so this was how I've done it, is to get a little flat spot. It won't be a sitter, obviously, because of that curved uh, shank, but um, <coughs> there's too much weight on this side for it to be a sitter, unless I counted it. But because the bowl is so deep, I couldn't risk doing anything like that, because that's not going to be the thickest amount of briar underneath the chamber. In terms of how it looks, George, it's definitely not a second. For me, this will be a candidate 
for a if I had such a thing as a two and a half star, then I would probably do that with this one. N not uh, ready to call it a three star, but certainly a two star easily. Um, but uh, what I would probably do is I'll probably stamp it a two star and then also put an X on it, which signifies seconds for my pipes. I've put X on a few of them already. But what I was thinking about this afternoon as I made this pipe is that um, what I might do is from now on is even on the seconds pipes, still put the X on to signify how it would, you know, it would have been had it not for the issue, had it not been for the issue that makes it a seconds. So in this pipe, the only thing which makes it a seconds is the fact that the drill is high. Um, other than that, um, it's an easy two star pipe for me. So I think what I will do is if I do end up selling it, I think it would be nice for the seller to have that, uh, for the buyer to have that, to show that it's a two star pipe, but it's a seconds, but that's fine. Um, I've got, for instance, a beautiful Parker Billiard, beautiful ring grain, I'm sure you guys have seen it. Um, and I bought that as a basket pipe in JJ Fox's for silly money. Why it's a seconds, I'm not entirely sure. Also, maybe something to do with the drill, I'm not sure. It smokes perfectly well. And I'm sure, to be honest, I'm sure this one will smoke fine as well. Um, I'll probably pack out the bottom with um, with a, a bowl coating and I'll probably just make it deeper and thicker at the bottom to bring the level up a little bit. So hopefully it'll smoke absolutely fine. So as I say, it'll be a two star, but it'll also have an X on it as well. The depth of the bowl, I'll just do a rough measurement. Uh, where's my ruler? I'll measure it from the lowest part of the uh, platter because that's generally where people will fill it up to. Um, it's about uh, 55 millimeters. To the bottom of the bowl and in inches that's Two inches and it's a 20 mil uh, width the bowl would you guys m mind very much if I went to top up my coffee Yeah, when you deal with plateau, you know, you're restricted, you know, because you obviously can't trim it to make it shorter. You've got to go with the full height so you keep the plateau. I'll be back shortly.
<clears throat> All right, we're back. Sorry to keep you guys. <sighs> Ooh, a lot of chat in my absence here. Good. What if he doesn't come back? Well, I'm back. The cigar is yours indeed. Paul, I don't know how close we are to each other. Without giving out any secrets, which uh, borough are you in? Oh, well, let's hope we don't get a second wave, honestly. My wife keeps saying that it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I just hope not. They've been talking about increase in China, new cases in China. Or as Mr. Trump says, China. Islington. Yeah, we could easily get together. Davidoff's have reopened. Um, JJ Fox's has reopened. Um, they haven't opened the cigar lounge yet, but you can go and buy a cigar. I don't know, George. Who knows? More testing does mean more cases. That's true. Um, and, you know, that amount of, you know, when we had the first spike, um, we probably had 10 times as many cases as they published, maybe even more. It wouldn't surprise me if we had in the millions. Um, so many people are having the anti, anti to see, the test to see if they've got the antidote, the anti, what do you call them? Um, I've got booked in with a doctor to go with my wife to get the test. I've had the actual coronavirus test uh, a couple of weeks back because I, I thought I was, might be feeling a bit under the weather again. Um, but that came back negative. And I'm going to have the test to see if I've got the antibodies. Um, so that's um, on, I think we're having that on Wednesday. Um, I ha there have been some people that I know, relatives, who have had the... My brother, for instance, he had it quite bad. He ended up being in hospital for a few days. Thank God he didn't have to go on a ventilator or anything like that. He just needed oxygen. Um, but um, So he's tested negative now, but his wife has tested... Um, she's got no antibodies, which means that she didn't get it from him, which is quite amazing. I've had quite a few cases like that where... One person in the family has had it, but the rest of the people didn't get it, which is quite astonishing considering how virulent this virus is supposed to be. It's really difficult to say, George, you know, who do you trust? Um, one thing I do know is that Um, I did the test myself, uh, James. Um, you get the option here, when you go in to drive in to get the test, you have the option of them doing it for you, and they come over completely hazmatted up, or you can do it yourself. Um, and uh, it's uncomfortable. You know, you've got to stick it down your throat until you gag, basically. Um, and then up your nostrils, um, which I did. And it came back negative. Hopefully, I did it right. Um, yeah, sometimes you just got to do things. I haven't watched uh, Dr. John Campbell for a while. I, I watched him religiously whilst I was unwell. Um, but uh, I haven't watched him more recently. His videos are really quite long. Um, so you need to have the time.
Well, it's it's slowed down a little bit here, George. Um, it's it's. I mean, there is certainly talk about it in the news, but not not as much as it has been. Right, I'm just going over to the lathe for a couple of minutes, and I'll be right back. And you can see if I can see what this uh, stain is looking like. Just give me a couple of minutes.
I fully agree with that. No need for TV these days. <laughs> right, I mean, this isn't finished by any means. But uh, you can get a good idea of what it's going to look like. Let's just turn this off. I don't know how much you can see. I've still got to spend more time getting the grain out exactly how I want it. So there's a bit of fading on the top, but I've still got to uh, get the grain out there more and around the junction. That's a little bit tighter, so I'm going to do a bit of sanding now. Little bit of bird's eye on the on the heel there. Don't know if you can make it out. All right, James, enjoy it. We'll know that you're there in spirit. I do make some stems, George. Um, this one is not a hand cut stem, but it certainly has a lot of work done to it. Um, but this, uh, I have done quite a few hand cut ones now as well. This is a, a hand cut stem I made for the, uh, the gooseneck pipe. was made straight from rodstock and um, so I'm not averse to making one but uh, the amount of time it takes at the moment where I'm at it makes more sense for me to to do um, pressed stems but the thing the areas where it's important um, I do that work anyway you know where to make it comfortable um, make sure it draws well, shaped well, bent well, all of that stuff I do anyway, so. It's, it's kind of about what return I get for my time. And at the moment, I'm not yet at a stage where it's going to make a huge amount of difference.
if this pipe um, wouldn't have that drilling issue, which is going to make it a second, I would be probably selling this pipe around somewhere between 200 and 250 pounds. If it wouldn't have had that issue. But as it stands, it will be sold. If it gets sold at all, it will be sold for less than that. So at the moment what I'm trying to do is reveal, reveal the bird's eye along this rim and it's slowly coming through. When I finish the pipe I'll do a recorded video with the camera facing, with a, you know, a better quality camera so you'll have a better view. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Tony. Sanding has also become something which is quite therapeutic. Because I used to hate sanding. It was interesting to hear uh, Jason Mouton saying how he hates sanding. But um, I've uh, gotten to like it and enjoy it. It's quite a peaceful, gives you a bit of serenity. You just got it kind of zoned in on this little tiny speck that you're working on and you just you forget everything you just focus on what you're doing
for you guys, I could imagine that just the little gentle sound of the sanding, the repetitive noise, can be quite calming as well. issues <laughs> with my joints. The silver band it works very well with Cumberland stems and it's why I went for because I went for the Cumberland stem I went for the darker stain um, I've been using a more orangey stain recently but this really I think works very well I don't drink hard drinks very often, sometimes on weekends a little bit, but I'm not a huge alcohol drinker. I don't enjoy the sensation very much. I enjoy a nice whiskey from time to time, but not because of the sensation, but because of the flavor. So I very rarely drink enough for it to have, you know, that uh, effect where you lose your inhibitions and that kind of thing. I don't think I've ever done that in my life. Just not something I enjoy. It's acrylic, yeah, acrylic Cumberland. Yes, the bird's eye is there. Um, you won't be able to see it in this. Um, FaceTime camera, but when I do the, f the recording at the end, when it's ready, hopefully you'll be able to see it. Yeah, that's true, Ken. Um, places like uh, Tom L Tank, he's always got a bunch of students there and they do all the back breaking stuff. I mean, he does as well, obviously, but uh, there are some pipes which he makes from beginning to end. 
the snail ones and, and all of the high-end ones, but he does have some which are made by his team. That's the advantage of being uh, a living legend, is that you have people who are desperate to work with you, to learn whatever they can. I'm sanding back the edges here so that you get it's like a bright line all the way around. It will kind of give it like a a framing if you like. Tony, four hundred bucks, it's yours. I'm gritting my teeth, Jimmy, more than anything else. This is uh, 600, I think. This should be 600.
Yeah, I was asking about that noise before. Um, sounds like something's going on that uh, on the lathe. Not sure what exactly. I can't get inside it to, to grease it up. Right, so that's where we're at at the moment. And I'm probably going to give it a thin coat of something just to bind it all together. Well, it's guaranteed, so I'm not going to mess with it if it's something wrong with it. So I'm either have to fix it or replace it. Problem is, is the hassle of getting it back to them. It's a 50 mile drive to the place, to Axminster. So this stain is barely there, it's a very light colour, but it just binds it together to give it a bit of a wood, sort of brings back a bit of the colour. Oftentimes with briar you have some spots which are brighter than others, and this, this just helps bind it all together. Well, because of the full bend, it may well be a clencher for some people. So now this colour I will do all over the plateau. Actually, that plateau needs a bit of a brush. that tagline is now associated with the
I was actually pulled over a few years ago, not making a video, but I was taking a selfie of myself smoking a cigar, and the truth of the matter is, the guy had every right to pull me over, and I was an idiot. <sighs> Nowadays, I don't do photos or anything like that when I'm driving. In the early days, if you look back at my feed, you'll see lots of photos of me holding up the pipe with the road in front of you, and nowadays you won't see that at all. It was extremely stupid of me. And I only take photos stationary. The videos, I'm not touching the camera. It's just literally recording as I'm driving. There's no difference to uh, using a hands-free phone.
Okay. So I'm gonna let that dry a bit, then I'll wipe it off, and then we'll wax it, canoba wax, and we're done. Bluebird pipes, no, I haven't seen them. Are they on Instagram? And as I say, the drill is, is a challenge. And I can see why people would be tempted to use uh, bent drill bits. I have no idea how they work, but I know they exist. Um, definitely been a challenge making this pipe. It's probably the longest I've spent on a pipe for a long time. Almost ready to wax. I just remembered I had something in the oven. Been in there too long, so I had to go and turn it off. I think plenty of people do finish cigars this way, but a lot of people use a nubber, which is effectively something like that, a prong, which enables you to hold the cigar when it gets a bit too hot. Whatever well, got cooking some chicken wings. 
I've developed this uh, very simple way of making wings when I'm just wanting something to nibble after work. I'll put a few wings straight in the oven with nothing on, no oil, no seasoning, no nothing. And I put it on a very high heat and usually for about half an hour, 35 minutes. And what that does is it really crisps, you have to have it on high, it crisps up the skin, makes it really, really crispy. And because of the heat, it cooks the inside of the wings very quickly. Usually chicken you'd put in for an hour or something like that, but wings are very small, so there's not much meat there. Um, and it cooks it right through. And then I'll usually just put some sweet and sour chili sauce on it or something, sweet chili sauce. Um, and it's delicious. And it's something not too heavy. This pipe bowl is a little bit too big, so I'm not getting a draw. Mm. That's better. Well, we're almost there, ready for waxing. I'm, I'm going to move you over so you can see the final process. And actually, I'll probably put a little bit of shellac around the plateau. Maybe, I'm not sure yet. We'll see if it glosses up. What I did was, is if you remember, I stained the tips of the nodules of the plateau. So hopefully that will come through. You can see there. Um, so when I um, when I buff it, hopefully those will shine up and the rest can stay matte. So maybe I won't shellac it. Cigar's gone out. For me, this is the best cigar lighter out there. So reliable. It's uh, the Maker's Vertigo. I'm pretty sure you can get them in the States as well. I've got a couple of them, and um, I have one upstairs. Oh, no, I've got one in the car and one in here. And they're fantastic. All right, I'm going to move you over to the lathe. See if we can get the final stage done. I think I'm going to switch cameras around so you get a good. Uh, where are we? There we go. Right, what have I done with the pipe? Oh, it's on a peg, of course. Right, so I'm just going to give it a little wipe, get rid of any residue.
Mike, you're coming right at the last. We're up to the buffing. The offer that I do have on the table is anybody that gets a seven day set gets the seventh one half price. thumbs down. It's the same people, Sados. Tony, I think you're confusing the straight grain with the bird's eye. The bird's eye is, is the little circle bits there. This stuff is all straight grain. All right, so I'm going to put you back on the table, but with the... Sorry if I made you dizzy there. Alright, 
So at least now you're on the better camera, so you can see it in all its glory. And there it is. So you can see the bird's eye there on the rim. So you can see here where that's a transition where it's transitioning from the bird's eye to the straight grain. It's somewhere halfway in between, you see that? So you've got bird's eye there on the bottom and there's the transition. I know a lot of people who just love that transitional bird's eye. Yeah, the drill is not ideal, Josh, it's not ideal. It's high at both ends. Let me get the torch. I've seen worse coming from factory pipes, but... See, there, there's the drill. I mean, I'm, it'll smoke, but it is high. There's no question about it, it's high. It's probably a good six or seven millimeters higher than the bottom of the bowl. And in the mortise, it's not as bad. I mean, you often get, um, let me just file that a little bit. Just clean the edge a little. There's a little bit of stain on the corner there, so it looks like it's not round, but it's round. Um, so it, it'll see enough of the filter, um, and if you don't put a filter in it, it's no problem at all. But um, I'll probably just open up that, uh, I'll probably just drill that so that it opens it up a little bit more so that it sees more of the filter. You can see there that it is high, no question. I'm not going to kid myself. That is a, that is, it does make this pipe a seconds in my view. Yeah, I'm sure it will smoke fine. I've had plenty of pipes with high drills. I will put a, a lot of the bowl coating down at the bottom just to bring it up a little bit. Yeah, I don't doubt it'll smoke well. It's it's about workmanship for me, and um, and I'm I'm delighted with it. Don't get me wrong. It's my first full bent, and I think that's an okay result for a first full bent. But at, um, in long term, I think you have to. Um, as I said earlier on, what a lot of people do is that they they drill that lower, they cut it lower so you can get a decent drill. And then they'll add a godet or a, some kind of band, a thick band or a wood extension, just to build it up. But they'll first drill it from there, and then they'll add a, a, a some kind of adornment on the shank, and that hides any sins beneath that, because that bit will be drilled perfectly, and you won't see what's going on beneath there. Um, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to just do it as it should be for now. And the next one, all I need to do is just shorten it a little bit, and then. Um, It'll be a lot easier for me, especially with 9mm large, larger mortise, I can go in at a better angle. This is really about the height of the shank, which has made it hard. Um, but it's what I wanted to do, and uh, there we go. I'm happy with the result.
I'll tell you, Mike, it's about, I would say it's, it's seven, eight mil, something like that. It's higher than the base of the pipe. You see green? I don't see green. Better not see any green. Yeah, just a sec, I'll do that, Mike. Well, it's pipe cleaner passing is a bit academic because it's a nine mil pipe. So if you've got a filter in there, you're not going to pass a cleaner anyway. And uh, because there's a large mortise in there, when you put the pipe cleaner in, sometimes it just misses it because there's a huge cavity inside. Okay, pipe cleaner. Let's see. Because of this curve, I don't think it'll hit it because you've got to bear in mind that there's a big mortise in there. So it's just a matter of luck as to whether it finds it or not. Which it won't. See, there's no way it's going to find that hole. There is the Can you see that Mike? Oh, it is high. I know it's high. I'm not hiding that fact. It is what it is. Would you agree with me that this makes the pipe a seconds? Or I could call it a first, but tell the customer that it has a high drill, but... seconds um, a pipe which has issues no you never heard that sure you have uh, you may need to carve a groove under the air passage in the shank Well, to me, a seconds is, is something which has, uh, I mean, some people might class a seconds if the briar's got problems, but for me, mechanically, there is an issue. It's not perfect. To me, that kind of makes it uh, a seconds. I don't know, I don't think it's critical, but I don't think it'll stop it smoking well. Especially if I build up the base. The drawer is wide open. It draws not a problem. Let me put a filter in it actually and see. That will really be the test. Mm. 
because if it doesn't go smooth with a the filter, then I'll have to open the bottom of the mortise a little bit. Passing a, a pipe cleaner in this is really academic, you know, it's, it's a filtered pipe. I read your mind, the, the draw is good. And the draw is fine with the filter as well. There is a bit of travel in there. The mortise is a little bit longer than the filter. Um, but other than but plenty of pipes do that. I don't think that makes it a second personally. I'm gonna drill it just a fraction and hopefully I won't mess it up. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's try it again. Okay, job's a good one. I'm leaving it there. It's absolutely fine. The drawer is fine.
Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for sticking with it. The pipe, she is done. There it is. I do like the way this junction worked out and it definitely did return on the time that I put into it. Um, I think that's probably the longest I've ever spent on a particular region of a pipe. Um, I think we must have spent about somewhere between an hour and a quarter and an hour and a half on this junction. Just getting that shape right and definitely paid off. Okay, so I think we'll call it a day. And I'll probably just do a short video just uh, to upload the pipe. And um, I need to just think on whether I call it a seconds or not. Unless I can significantly build up that base um, with a bowl coating. Um, I think in my mind it has to be a second. It's just the way my mind works. So I'll hopefully be able to build it up somewhat and we'll see how it looks. Um, the only issue with that is, is that um, if there's a reservoir, if you like, of, of uh, bowl coating at the bottom, it never really gets rock hard, that coating, um, unless there's a really good char built up on it. And... Um, Whoever does smoke the pipe and then just sort of scrapes it out might end up scraping through that. Um, so I have to really think about that. So there we have it. We call it a day. Thank you very much, everybody. Whoever stayed um, along for the ride. Um, I think it's three videos now in total. We'll see how long they take to upload. Since the COVID-19 situation, everything takes longer. Um, the live ones take longer. The short recorded ones, they get uploaded straight away, but the for some reason, the lives take longer to upload. Anyway, thanks everybody. Wish you all a wonderful night. I'll catch you on the next one.